You are now tuned into the truth frequency. We are TFR. TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. Welcome to Phoenix Rising Radio. Now is the time to lift your mind higher. Now is the time to rise above. I am your host, Phoenix, and welcome to tonight's broadcast. Hello, this is Phoenix. I hope you guys are doing well. Sorry for the delay there. We were supposed to have someone on else with us this evening, and apparently they couldn't make it. Uh, So we will be um, bringing the Reverend Dr. Phil on here in just a moment. And he is going to be talking about the moon, the moon phases and other things. So hold on a second. Hmm. Someone says, are you on today, brother? That was lucky. Oh, yes, I am. I am. We were actually uh, we were actually going to have uh, Nase hosting the program tonight, and I have no idea what happened. I was on the switchboard listening just in case something happened. He was going to be doing the show himself. And apparently and I'm talking. Okay, you're here now. Okay, So. (laughs) This is this is like my world as it usually perchance is. Everything was fine and dandy setting up, but then the minute that uh, the bumper started, everything went warble on me. But I'm here. Okay, cool. And uh, thank you for being here with us. <laughs> thank you for being here. And, uh, if uh, we if have- Phoenix, if you want to go into the ether again in the spirit, <laughs> well. That's uh, totally up to you, Nase. Um, you had prepared to do the show this evening yourself. Um, and if that is the case, I guess we'll, uh, we will do it that way. I'm glad you are here. Uh, but fortunately, I was right here at the switchboard and listening. I had prepared other things I was doing this evening. And thank goodness, because we do have some automatic things here at TFR that would have clicked us over into pre-recorded programming etc so anyway i'm glad you're here and i guess you will be bringing the reverend dr phil on here at the top of the hour also so you guys have a a really good evening and i see dr phil's ready to go so uh whenever you want to bring him on and i'll be listening in just in case something happens man just let me know well i i appreciate you uh being my guardian angel at this time phoenix and uh and you might as well bring in Phil here, and I'll do a little babbling on, and, and thank you again. Um, and we'll kind of do well, a little good reset. Hey, and Phoenix, it's Reverend Dr. Phil. Yes. Uh, Always just a give, pleasure to be on the show here. Well, thank you for joining us. If, uh, if you can uh, indulge me for a few moments there, uh, Reverend Doctor. Um, for all of you <laughs> joining 
us in this kind of crazy delay of things and technical difficulties when they can happen they usually do gremlins nsa uh the sun and heat waves many possibilities anything's plausible everything's possible but we are here now the phoenix rising radio on tfr and thank you all for being with us um, there are many different ways that you can listen to us iheart radio at the tfrlive.com site and there's some applications also you also have the opportunity to call in and listen i ask that you all peruse the tfr website and take a look around. There are plenty of shows that will stretch your imagination and get your mind uh, generating different thoughts as you peruse the website. And there are special offers that you can see there at tfrlive.com. Tonight, I have our guest as a usual guest. He's not a stranger to all of you, but he's a stranger to me in a sense that we've only done a couple shows together, and that's the Reverend Dr. Phil, and uh, he is going to join us tonight. We're going to discuss a little bit more about my moon epiphany. Um, I haven't shared the nitty-gritty with um, Reverend Doctor, and we're going to do that tonight, but first I thought we'd take a moment or two to uh, introduce you, sir, and if you could, tell me about yourself. Thank you, Nase. Well, I am what they call Reverend Dr. Philip DeLong. I am a psychic medium. I am a healer. I am a teacher and an ordained minister. Most of my work was through the International Association of Metaphysics. My doctor of ministry came from from the Lively Stones World Healing Fellowship, which is outside of Tallahassee in Florida. And that is recognized by the state of Florida education committees. And I work in a town in Florida called Casadega, which is a spiritualist camp. So I do all sorts of metaphysical work, and things have been pretty strange today. I think it's any type of electronics, if you relied on them, most of them failed. Oh, absolutely. That's uh, one of my jokes we have at the house. Every now and then, the technology works very well for me, but then there's sometimes, usually when I'm a little stressed out, that uh, things start glitching out. And for the most part, I wasn't that stressed out until I started hearing the wobble or the warble this morning. But um, you're on the East Coast in Florida. How long have you um, been into the metaphysical aspect of the world? Well, I have always had an interest in it since my formal education, you would say. So, uh, when I was, I say, high school and college, I studied it. When I was a young lad, probably about five or six years old, I had the psychic gifts and the mediumship gifts. I was brought up Catholic, so I had an overactive imagination, and these things didn't exist. But as I had gotten out of the, I guess, work field or our, you know, work life. I have studied metaphysics for the last 20 years. And Wonderful. Have... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's fine. We, we can. So then uh, can you give the audience any uh, way that they can contact you or take a look at some of your feats of the past? and how they could use your assistance for any challenges they may have? They can go to my website, which is 
dot r e v d r phil dot com, and they can text or call me at area code three eight six four five three nine three five six. Wonderful. Now, um, when you uh, started getting into the aspect of metaphysicals, when uh, you you wanted to find those avenues, did it seem like they fell in place, or did you have to actually do the research and and dig into it? They just norm- naturally just fell into pl- into place, and they say. It most of it fell into place when I was 12 years old. I had a near-death experience, and I was riding a bicycle and was dragged under a jeep for about 50 yards, and that put me in a coma for about three and a half days. It's when that near-death experience, it, there was no tunnel, there was no loved ones. It was just straight right to the light. And there right. I had met a couple of what I would call guides who gave me a tour of the universe. Now, what are your what are your thoughts that all of us have these abilities, yet some people, you know, they may have it a little bit more than others, but do you believe that everybody can tune their abilities? Absolutely. There are some people who, like John Edward, w- would say that everybody or a medium is born with those gifts, and that is what it is. And before he became famous, he would say that everybody can develop those gifts. And when we look at the universe, when we look at the oneness, then we are an aspect of everybody. We're an aspect of our higher self. We're an aspect of our guides, our masters, our teachers. We're an aspect of God. So then everything belongs within us, and we can develop that. Well, you know, it's it's really interesting because just today, as I was discussing things with my 10-year-old and she was trying to do something on the computer and she was getting frustrated with it. And, and I said, okay, let's take a moment and breathe and relax. And why are you getting frustrated? And right away it was, I can't do this. And then it's like, well, do you remember when you couldn't ride a bike or do you remember when you uh, couldn't do your pogo stick? You know, and I kind of make her, made her recognize that, you know, we, we can't always just start running, you know, as children, as infants, we, we have to learn to sit up first and then we learn to crawl and then we learn to walk and then we can run. And I believe this is the same when it comes to metaphysics where the, uh, the special gifts that we all have, that once we recognize those gifts and if there's something of interest, then to hone it or tune it in or practice makes perfect. Um, would you agree with that at all? I would totally agree with that, Naysay. It's When I teach my classes, it's the first thing I state to my students is that I am here for you to remember. So it's All that information is recorded in our DNA. It actually belongs to our subconscious or superconscious, however you look at that. And it is something that our spirit has. And we have to look at what is coming through for spirit or or how we connect to those spirit, to spirit that comes to us. Well, you know, and, oh, go ahead, yeah. sir. I, I apologize. There's a slight, there's a slight delay, and so uh, I, I will try my best not to step over you. But uh, well, that's, as, uh, I understand that because I'm not on Skype. I'm calling in, so you got about a three-second delay, 
and that was one of the electronic um, problems I had today is that my wife's computer that I was going to use Skype on crashed. So she needs a new hard drive. Right. So uh, everybody um, do what you can to utilize the Reverend Doctor here so he can get that new hard drive for his wife. But um, when uh, when I started researching the truth, <laughs> unfortunately, the first thing that I found out is that I hadn't been told the truth. But then when it came to metaphysics, it seemed like and, and when I say they, I call them the powers that should not be, because I'm not going to get wrapped up if it's the Jesuits or the Jews or ISIS or the Bilderbergers or the Trilateral Commission or the Masons or the Illuminati, you know, because I believe that these people or the they, they will claim to be anything they can be in order to continue distracting us and working for their agenda. So when I say the they, that's who I'm referring to. But in my research of metaphysics, it seems like they have continuously kept this knowledge away from the general populace, that they do not want us to metaphysically awaken because quite frankly, if we came to that awakening, we wouldn't let them be in power anymore. I agree with that. There are a lot of control mechanisms that come into play as to how they allow us not to awaken. And part of that has to do with the truth or if you look at it as trust and we are trusting in a lot of mechanisms we trust in our family we trust in re our religion maybe we trust in our government but it's or educational system but it's there where they put all the controls into us it's there is where they brainwashes. It's as part of the family. It's our family um, chooses us, our religion. They choose us, our educational system. And within that is control. The educational system, way back when, they have the bells ringing for school every day, and all that is is to train us into, if you're a union worker, then that's the bell that starts a shift for a day, and then the bell blows at the end of the day. So no, you couldn't be... Re you could be referring to Pavlov's dog and how he trained <laughs> oh, animals. It, it, exactly. it could be that simple. Of, of... <laughs> You're making me laugh. So, yes, that, that's exactly what it is. So. Well, that's really interesting that we, we bring it up in the conditioning it because one of the latest things that I have been re- researching on is MK Ultra, and I was fortunate enough at one time to actually have a government document that was titled MK Ultra Mind Control and Behavior Modification, and that behavior modification is just a really simple way of conditioning conditioning from the moment that we were born, especially in America, because, you know, that's what I mainly know is my experience of being in America for over 50 years. And now that I find out from the moment of our birth that there was an agenda for me to fulfill a monetary obligation in this country of America, just because of where I was born. And then when you throw on top of it with the 
ethnicity or the breakdown composition of the individual, then you get into the other conditioning where I'm Native American and British. And so I have the conditioning of my father and my mother. Now, I can't fault them because they themselves were conditioned to play the same role as I was born into. So could that possibly be part of the whole born into sin? I would agree with that, Naysay. And you have to look at it. The they's have the agenda. And it's not for us making, you know, our uh, climbing up the ladder. They, they actually want that, but it really doesn't really get us anything. It's we're, we're seeing the truth only as they envision it. And when you wake up to the metaphysical aspects, it's then you're going within and you are unlocking certain DNA codes within that, okay, we're not going to actually go out there and be radicals and change the world, but there is a consciousness out there that is going to make change. And they try to suppress that too. Right. Well, as a Native American, we divide our individual into four parts in a sense, um, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And as you research this metaphysical aspect of the world, and as you research the control mechanisms that the they have been creating, you'll find out that we are being bombarded on all aspects of our being. And when you hear me and Phoenix refer to this time and time again, that, you know, there is a spiritual battle that is going on, I absolutely agree with that. What would you think? I totally agree with that, Naysay. And the spiritual battles, it's when we are looking at our physical, emotional, and mental bodies, per se, and um, that that is the one we can touch, feel, and actually, you know, bleed with, if you say that. But th those are the ones that come in, and this is what we deal with in everyday life. Now, the spiritual aspect of it actually has four bodies to it, the astral body, the etheric duplicate, celestial, and causal. But when we look at it, and that is developed as we spiritually developed, but typically they, from the astral level, they are controlling certain aspects of that, so we don't even get there. Well, absolutely, and, and I would agree that in each of those four quadrants that I brought up, you could break them down into four more and four more as you continue to do the breakdown, you know, but the fact of the matter is, is easily we can discuss how physically, through the use of these horrific foods that they're claiming to have any type of nutritional value when the body is not able to build a better you. It's like using subpar ingredients. Then you add in the chemtrails and the fluoride in the water and, and the, the many aspects of the physical realm where they're tearing us down. Emotionally, quite easily found how they're doing this to us either. They're getting us into an emotional state by dividing us by sexuality, by gender, by the red team, by the blue team, or, or by the purple team. <laughs> and uh, I guess <laughs> yeah. I'm saying purple team because the Vikings, I found out, did win. And uh, I'm actually going to bring that story up when we come back from the break because I didn't even know. Uh, are you a sports person at all, sir? Yes, I am. 
Well, I I am not the sports person whatsoever, and I did not even know that the Vikings were going to be playing on Sunday until Saturday when a friend of mine came to visit me, and, and he gave me a little bit of a lecture of how can I not be aware of the Minnesota Vikings and uh, being in the state of Minnesota. But I, 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 I believe that the they have worked their way into the NFL and the AFL, and they are definitely saying, hey, if you really want to make that million dollars next year, I advise that you drop the ball right now. And this is the little speaker in their helmet, of course, that they're talking to the players with. But that's that's my assumption. I, I can't validate that. The only proof I have is that in the 80s at the Bilderberger Group in Canada, over 200 of the highest paid sports um, members were there during this two-week gala behind walls with submachine guns blocking them. So come back, and we'll talk a little bit more about it with the Reverend Dr. Phil. No hate, no hype, no, 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 no fear. We are T. Something happening here But what it is ain't exactly clear There's a man with a gun over there Telling me I got to beware I think it's time we stop Children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down Welcome back. Welcome back. We are here. I am here. They are here. We're all here together. This is Phoenix Rising Radio. It is Tuesday the 16th. The new moon, the darkness of the month is upon us. Woo! Spooky. And uh, thank you all for being here. I, again, apologize for the technical difficulties at the beginning of the show, but I think we are rolling right along. And joining us today is our good friend and becoming my friend, the Reverend Dr. Phil. How are you doing again, sir? I am doing fine, they say. Well, before we went on to the break, we were telling a little bit about uh, we, we brought up the football game. And I'm going to play Kate for the sports nuts out there and share my little story about Sunday, um, the Vikings. And I just totally forgot who they were playing against. But anyway, the Vikings, my home team, were playing football. And a buddy of mine called me up at the fourth quarter beginning of the fourth quarter and said hey i'm going to swing by after the game and uh i said fine and so uh my other buddy that was here with me i joked with him like did you know that the vikings were playing today and he was like yes and i said who are they playing and he's like i don't know and then all of a sudden i had an epiphany and if you guys have heard me before and I talk about the age of Aquarius. I talk about the color of the age of Aquarius. And the color of it is purple. And so I said that the Vikings are going to win. And he's like, how do you know they're going to win? And I said, because they have a purple jersey on. And he goes, really? And I said, and what's going to happen? It is going to be like the movie of the week. It's going to be like down to the wire, down to the last play, and it's going to be some miraculous thing where the Vikings are going to win. And so then, lo and behold, my buddy isn't showing up, and uh, he finally shows up, and he comes in, and he tells us 
this incredible story of what happened, and it was pretty much exactly how I predicted it. Now, I am going to throw a prediction out there that I believe, and, and, and just because of colors is why I believe this, that I just found out that the, um, the Patriots, their colors are red and blue. Now, as we talk about the dichotomy, the red and blue, the division, this side, that side. So my prediction is that it's going to be the Patriots with their red and blue against the Vikings, and the Vikings are going to take it. The purple is going to win because that will go with the whole stream of consciousness that the powers that should not be are shoving down our throats with the color purple. What do you think there, sir? Well, that's very good, you know. However, everything is crooked. So I believe the Pats or Patriots and the Vikings will get to the Super Bowl. It's, I, I'm, I feel the Patriots are going to win, but it's going to be because some blown play or something. Well, most definitely, the one thing that we cannot argue is that the football industry is making billions of dollars. And if they want us to continue to watch, they need us to be on the edges of our seats, and they need us to invest deeply into them. And one thing that I ask my buddy is, how many people do you think have heart attacks on these weekends to the point of when they're screaming and yelling at the TV and they're almost blowing blood vessels? I got to b- believe between 100 and 200 people that many. So, yeah, I, I would I not realize it or not, you know. Yeah, I, I would not be surprised at all because, you know, there are there are some people that spend hours and hours and hours. And it, it is kind of funny sometimes because I hear about some of these sports fathers that spend all of this time way into sports. And yet they get upset at their kids because they're playing all of these video games. And I really get a big delight of. You know, when you when you talk to people about, you know, do you watch too much TV or too much sports? And then they say, oh, well, we, we don't own a TV or I don't own a TV. And it's like people, we have smartphones in our hands where we spend hours and hours just staring into the tiny little screen, hoping to find the answers when when we should really look within ourselves in that metaphysical aspect. And in that search, we have these assistants or these helpers or these teachers like the good Reverend Dr. Phil to where you have the opportunity to utilize his experience, his knowledge, and help yourself move along in the metaphysical realm so that we all could become enlightened in this time of darkness? Yeah, that that is very true. But I I have to tell you, on a personal level, I got rid of my cable TV last February, so I do not have TV. I have not watched one NFL game this year. I just follow the scores. And it is something out of, you might call it patriotism, or it's part of that red versus blue. It's a distraction that I don't need. It's, I do watch a little bit on Netflix. I um, watched the two seasons of Stranger Things, and that is kind of an interesting show because it goes into a little bit of soft disclosure about portals, um, negative portals and beings. 
in the government itself. It's the other show I work is on standard TV, but I watch it on Netflix on a rerun thing, and that is called The Good Place, which is just a comedy about heaven and hell. Mostly, well, you know, I, I too am guilty, you know, of perusing the TV stations and stuff. And even though I'm blind, they now have video descriptions to where I can be right there in it too. Where I'm lucky is that I can put something on and have it playing in the background and I don't get caught up in the visual aspect of it, of where I'm just sitting there staring at the TV along with listening to it. So I can just go about my business and get other things done. And then when it's a time where it sparks my interest, then I tend to focus in on it. And I, and I put this out there for all of you that have unlimited data and you're doing road trips. You can put your Netflix on and use your video description and it will tell you the story as it is going through the dialogue of it. And so it it may not be exactly the same, but if any of you still have any kind of imagination left, you can utilize that just like old radio theater and uh, have the greatest visuals that you can compared to the visuals that they make you look at. So just a little tip, if, if you're road tripping it and you're bored and you don't have that good audio book, but uh, yeah, that Stranger Things, we should definitely in the future do a show about that because that is a very, very interesting series in itself. The latest one that I just started checking out is that one titled Wormwood. And this one talks about MK Ultra and the uh, Dr. Forrestal, who allegedly committed suicide jumping out of a hotel room in New York City. But, uh, but anyway, football, sports, TV, gaming, sugar your relationship, you know, we can look at it and from the perspective, we make the denotation of whether or not it's positive or negative. And that's for you to decide because you are allowed to do what you want to do in this world. And as long as you're not harming anybody else, I will not have a challenge with it. I do have challenges when you harm yourself But hey, it's yourself, and I would rather you not be harming yourself, but but you you really can't make anybody do anything. That is totally true. One of my favorite sayings is, the only one who can save you is yourself. And that has to do with some of the, you know, controls religion puts on us. It's when we look at Christianity and they say that the only one who can save you is Jesus. And that's just a control mechanism because the only one who can save you is yourself. And then we look at Buddhism and the path to enlightenment is to find the cause of suffering. But then, but nobody has to suffer. That's just something as to a control mechanism. Well, I I do think a lot of times that we, because of whether it's lack of respect of oneself or even one's self-esteem being so low, sometimes I think we make the choice to suffer. And and it's 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 one of those things that never made sense to me, you know, and and I suffer. I suffer, yep. but I, I I try not to, you know, go on and on about it where I may recognize the suffering, but then that's it. I acknowledge the suffering, and then I try to find the beauty or the things that bring me back into that state of positiveness or that state of love. Absolutely. Anyway, you brought up the old-time radio shows where we had to use our 
imagination to, you know, co- come up with the storyline, and, and actually the characters were actually portrayed. And it kind of reminds me of War of the World. And we had these two incidents over the weekend in Hawaii and Japan. And it is something that I don't think is a mistake. It is something that either in that emotional field being controlled by them or they that is being, you know, deliberately uh, yeah, absolutely. And it and right away when I heard about it, I got on the phone and I called some of my friends that I have out there in Hawaii and uh and they were shaken up by it. And 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 from my experience in the military and doing drills and stuff like that, you know, for more times than not, there are safety checks and backup checks and rechecking and double checking and triple checking. And I just have a really hard time swallowing it that someone hit the wrong button. But, you know, but that's my conspiracy wheels rolling. And that's a great segue because with a little bit of time before we uh, top at top of the hour comes around again, I am going to present to you, Reverend Doctor, the epiphany that I had, and I'd like to get your intake on it because it's it's been a little obsessive for the last three weeks. Now, the precursor of it is, as a Native American, I'm constantly being aware of the sunrise, sunset, and the positioning of the moon whether it be in the status of full, waxing, waning, or new. And on the radio three weeks ago, me and Phoenix would bring up this this time of year, whether it be the equinox, the solstice, or whatever phase of the moon was. And I was telling Phoenix about all of the time frames are off, that the equinox and the solstice are not connecting with man's calendar of the equinox and the solstice and so we had a new moon on the 3rd of december and i and i believe that between the 4th and the 11th of december was the actual true winter solstice of the longest day now after that new moon on the 3rd of December, we had New Year's, and on the 1st of January, we had a super new moon. And that is a natural lunar cycle. Do you remember, Reverend Doctor, in astronomy, how many days in a lunar calendar? They had taught us 28 days. Correct. And to be technical, it was 27.5. And it correlates with a woman's menstrual cycle. So then when me and Phoenix were on the air and he talked about the new moon on the first and he was telling me about, he he made the comment about, well, the next new moon is going to be on. And in my head, I make the count and I'm like, okay, the 29th. And he said the 31st. And he started discussing not only was it going to be a full moon, but it was going to be a super moon and a blue moon and an eclipse of the moon and a red moon. And then I call the blood moon. Yes, correct. And so then I, I said to him, I'm like, wait, wait, you said the 31st. And he said, yes. And I'm like, that's impossible because a lunar calendar month is 28 days. And that didn't jive. It was 30 days. And then, as the week progressed, we find out that February, which is a month with 28 days, 29, if there's a leap year, there is no full moon. And then, 
again in March. On March 1st, we have another full moon. And then we have another once in a blue moon on the 31st. Now, these calendars are not written a couple of weeks before the New Year's. Calendars are usually written and made up a full year in advance. And so what I've been trying to find out in my research is who, who is the overall authority that says this is where you put the new moons and this is where you put the full moons because things are not sinking. And as we were just talking earlier, that when we're out of whack and we're out of sync, how are we able to cope in this crazy world if they are keeping us out of sync? It's kind of what I would call a strange phenomenon. I have, uh, I don't have the answer quite to what you just said, but my astrologer, her name is Dickie Jo Mullen, but she always says that the moon does not, or the moon does move at different speeds. It's always changeable, and this is in quotes, swear not by the inconstant moon. But if you really want the answer, it's go to Easter and how the Catholic Church figures it out. And that happens to be the first Sunday after the full moon. Well, well, yes, and this goes into the man's calendar of where they start setting up their, their systems of control or their system of time, which is the ultimate illusion because it is the greatest prison that the, they have created to confine us with. And then when you look at the indigenous peoples and you look at their calendar system, it is basically on the flow of the natural cycles of this incredible dance between the moon and through the, uh, the solar system. Now, a, a question I have for you with your, uh, with your astrologer. Now, do they put in the fact that I think it was last year or the year before they were claiming that there was a 13th constellation? They just yes. failed to tell us about it. That's correct. And I, I don't remember which one that they named it, but yeah. The dragon. Have... The dragon correct. or the serpent. <laughs> Okay, so it's so, and I've seen some calendars with that, but typically it hasn't really been accepted. Well, it, it's it's really interesting in the the fact that we have this Gregorian calendar, the Julian calendar, and the calendars of yester yore, and then now with this crazy change that just came upon us it just sprung upon us where all of a sudden our moon cycles are out of the regular whack because if a moon cycle was 30 days then there would only be 12 new moons in a calendar year however as a native american we look at the back of a turtle because a turtle has 13 proportions in its shell. And this correlate, correlates with the 13 moon calendar. However, if you step back and you look at a different perspective, there is a 14th section of the turtle's back if you constitute the entire shell. And this goes into some of the epic teachings of uh, the 13 and the 14. And when we start talking about Isis and Set and Horus and Osiris. 
Were these indigenous people or these people of the past, did they really have the full clue? Or were they doing the same thing as the powers that should not be are today, just giving us a little bit of the knowledge so they can keep all of the control? Your thoughts? Well, it, it is totally, uh, I, I like your analogy. I, I like the, you know, thing about this 13th zodiac sign, which um, it has to do with Osiris or Osiris, but it's going down to Apollo and Hades and how we're actually um, doing some of that stuff. Like you said, the original serpent holder Enki, that Sumerian god, which all goes back to that Egyptian stuff. So with that being into what cycle should be we really be using? And it should be the moon cycle. It should be that 28-day cycle with the 13 months of the year. Well, and it's, it's really interesting as you bring up those cycles of the past where the doctrine has been denotated. We can go all the way back to ancient Babylon, Samir, and, uh, and look at like Zachariah Stitchin in his books where they talk about the Sumerian myths. And then from the Sumerian myths, you get the Egyptian myths. And then from the Egyptians, you get the Greeks. And then from the Greeks, you get the Romans. And from the Romans, you get the saints. And then yeah. from the saints, now we get the New Age movement, the New Realm. We are entering in Aquarius, the dawning of the new age. And to me, the term new age, it sounds pretty much the same as new world order. And after the break, I'm just going to say something about this blue moon, blood moon that's coming up. So, Absolutely. Um, and, and With the new world order, exactly what is that going to be? It's... Phoenix has talked about the leveling a lot, or he's talked about the leveling, so there's going to be a leveling there, and what is that new world order going to be? Where is our consciousness going to be? Absolutely, and I have no problem whatsoever with one world government if I thought they had any integrity, so come back and listen to us True some more. Thank radio is your number this is Truth Frequency Radio. The wicked ones obviously under heavy, heavy Masonic <laughs> influence. <laughs> Rising Radio. Now is the time to lift your mind higher. Now is the time to rise above. I am your host, Phoenix, and welcome to tonight's broadcast.
Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. It is not Phoenix. It is I, Naysay, doing it solo, but Phoenix is here in spirit. You are listening to Truth Frequency Radio, Phoenix Rising Radio. Thank you all for being here. Please, please be a supporter of the truth. Please be a supporter of Phoenix, and you can show your appreciation and support by going to TFRlive.com and looking around there and finding Mr. Phoenix's name and Phoenix Rising Radio. Click on it and become a supporter. When you are a supporter, you help the wheels keep spinning and keep a rolling for the better. So please do what you can. Give what you can, take what you need. Tonight, our guest is is uh, no stranger to the show. It is the uh, the metaphysical guru that you all know and love, the Reverend Dr. Phil. Welcome back, Dr. Phil, and uh, thank you again for being on with me tonight in my solo flight of... Uh, Phoenix Rising Radio. And maybe we do not have Reverend Dr. Phil here. And All right. I will now you have me. He is here. He is here. Welcome back, sir. So what I got psychically with this full moon coming up on the 31st is it is a blue moon it's a super moon and it's a blood moon because it it's close to the eclipse so what i got psychically was all right it's a blue blood moon and then what is a blue blood and a blue blood is an old term for those of aristocracy and so I'm seeing with the energies that the they's power are going to collapse well that's okay. you know that's really interesting that you say that too because just as I was talking earlier about when we brought up sports when you look at the blue moon and the blood red moon we have blue and red which makes purple, and purple is also a color well notif- noticed with royalty. That's correct. So it's when we look at the purple of the age of Aquarius, it is when I look at those two colors, um, that red and um, the blue and forming that purple, it's almost like the energies of what you would call heaven and earth kind of merging together. And it's something that is going to be a powerful energy that is going to sweep. And when I look at violet or that purple, yeah, it's... I go to one of the Ascended Masters, St. Germain, and I always work with that violet flame. That's one that works with alchemy, spiritually turning lead into gold, and it also works with uh, getting rid of a lot of negativity or transmuting that negativity. Well, you know, it's it's, it's interesting. Um, absolutely, and it's and it's interesting as we're talking about this lunar cycle and how this lunar cycle is disrupted, and then within these disruption of the cycles, you see these smaller cycles where it's like the once in a blue moon, or the red moon, or the the super moon. You know, they're all different cycles that are are in synchronicities with each other. So it's almost like 
when you're putting a jigsaw puzzle together or when you're connecting the dots, when you take a look and you and you really look, you you take the all the observational skills you have and you look and all of a sudden you see that, oh, this matches up and then this matches up. And when you see all of these alignments, when you see all of this fine tuning, if you're able to step back and look at the picture, I believe the universe will tell you what it is you need. Interesting enough, have you ever done any research about how birds see? No, I have not. Only that I know that when I read up a lot of about um, the dinosaurs and stuff is that they actually ascended from them. Right. Well, so. when a, when a bird sees in his eyes, he ha- they have um, little flecks of metal or a heavy metal in their eyes. And because they see on a different visual spectrum than we do, that when they're flying... The north looks blue and south looks red and where the two meet is purple. And so when they notice that, oh, look, it's getting bluer and bluer, I need to head south. And now that it's getting redder, you know, they adjust accordingly. Now, this goes back to what we were just talking about, the red and the blue and the purple. When I discuss the Holy Trinity, positive, negative, and balance, or love, fear, and content. And then we talk about the Democrats and the Republicans, the blue and the red, and Donald Trump wearing his purple tie, and purple being this thing of balance. So why... Why would they keep this knowledge from us? It's one of those trust and control things and more or less on the control and they want to hold all the power. Well, I I feel horrible that I just dumped that huge question on you. I'm sorry, but go ahead. (laughs) It's like people have to wake up, and people wake up in certain, um, I, I guess, stages. And every people have to remember that everything is expanding. It's your truth always expands. It it doesn't stay the same every day. It's that knowledge that you are receiving your truth change and what has been accepted in the past will change to something else in the now or in the future and when you look at that expansion it's when your third eye is even opened it's you get that kundalini awakening and you see this visions and you get knowledge Um, but your third eye always expands as well. And there are ways to expand it. It's once you get that Kundalini awakening, it's that's just the first plateau. There is more to get. Well, so when, go ahead. Well, go ahead, sir. Sorry. No, go ahead. Naysay. Um, well, I was going to say when, uh, when I had the opportunity to go on Paranormal Portal on uh, Friday nights and Sunday nights with uh, lovely Mr. Brent, um, we got to discussing this this a little bit as he gave me the opportunity to share my month conundrum. And with all of these cycles that, and I, I call it the cycles of the psychos, You know, because the easiest disruption of any cycle is to add another cycle to it. 
And so as they continue us to distract us with these multitudes of cycles, they're able to keep the control. And as we start awakening, not everybody is going to awake at the same time. We know from our experiences that we have those friends that wake up in the morning and they're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and ready to go. And we have those other friends that need a couple cups of coffee or this, that, and the other thing. And you, you best not poke the bear early in the morning. Your thoughts? It's we are all have our own like uh, awakenings, like you're saying. But a lot of people are in this mundane world, and, and this is what I have to do. It, it is I have that they're still in survival mode. They're not going beyond. You know, they're they're at the lowest lowest vibration or they're at the root chakra type um, mentality. I have to um, work. I have to have a house over my head. I have to have food on the table. I have to procreate. I have to uh, just follow the American dream. And with that dream, then I need, you know, two or four cars now in my driveway. I, I need this big mortgage, and, and it's just a vicious cycle, vicious cycle. But then when they start to get that awakening, then they're, they're going to go into more or less an abundance-type um, frequency or vibration and then they'll realize that what why am i doing this and i can make it a lot easier for me and then when they waken from that it's why didn't i listen to myself like 20 years ago and i'd be better off but then that's where your intuition and power comes in and from there then the awakening just goes farther and farther but Everybody is in the mundane type um, vibration because at that point, they don't know any better. That's why, okay, I'm going to be wide type bushy tail in the morning, and I'm going to my grind. Well, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit more critical than that because, you know, as we talked earlier about suffering, you know, when... When individuals and people figure out what their method of gaining power is, they tend to stick to it. And whether that be playing the victim or or playing the the you know, like the four agreements, you know, where it, it talks about the individuals of, of people and how people are you know it, and it's unfortunate or fortunate that when we try to gain power we don't do it in a respectful way where it's a give and take and i believe that this is from the disruption of the cycles where we are in that survival mode where we're more or less fighting tooth and nail to get what we can. But again, like they say, you know, one bad apple will destroy the whole barrel because there is seemingly a increase of what I call the entitlement society where people think that they deserve it all. Oh, I totally agree. I know people who that's all they do is get entitlement money and they're happy at there, but that's all they're going to. And some of them will call themselves spiritual just because they have a disability and they need to, you know, um, fool the system or work with the system, however you want to call it. But, you know, it's they're happy with that. And, and there's when you look and there's there's that that challenge of like 
do we fault them? Do we fault them? Do we do the sympathy or the empathy? Because look at our leaders. Look at the politicians. Look at the judges, the police, the clergy. You know, they are also placating to this entitlement thought process of what can I do the least of to get the most of that I totally agree with that I mean we pay our legislators enough and I don't even know if they work four months a year but probably a little more than that it's they write their own laws they write their own you know medical care system it's they 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 can blame everybody else you know we'll send them to jail like martha stewart for insider trading but um that doesn't affect us so we're kind of immune from that and it's they just get richer and richer greedier and greedier and they could care less about their constituents well you know I I kind of follow politics as much as I follow sports because when and and it was blatantly a slap in the American public's face when John Kerry and George Bush were running against each other and I can't remember the the commentator's name but he came straight out and asked both of them you're both part of the skull and bones, aren't you? And they both just joked about it. You know, and if you do any research on the skull and bones, they swear a blood oath to help each other. And quite frankly, I think John Kerry just ran for president so he could get that huge war trust. And it was his reward for just kind of glossing over the old SNL trading debauchery that occurred in yesteryear that he chaired the committee that looked over that that whole uh, yeah. swiping of the money. You know, but interesting enough, you know, talking about politics, you know, as they do the Senate and you look into the Capitol and you look behind them on the walls, I remember you would see a fasci. You would see a bundle of twigs you know, which isn't a bad thing, but in that bundle of twigs, you see that hatchet. And that hatchet states a lot. It's one thing to have them all bundling us up together, but the other aspect that they have that hatchet, more or less that, hey, if you're not going to stick in the bundle, then what can occur? And this goes to the whole aspect of cohesion like a five watt light bulb you can barely read with a five watt light bulb but a five watt laser will cut a hole in something and the difference between a five watt light bulb and a five watt laser is how tight and how how uh, um how Packed is the wave, the field, the cohesion of it all. And this is where we, as America, as North America, as the globe, the world, that this constant division between us isn't going to get us anywhere. But when we find that coercion and we group together, thus builds the power. It's like that metaphor with the Native Americans of one arrow you can easily snap, but when you have a handful of arrows, it's much harder. I agree with that, but we have to look at where is our cohesion, because we have pretty much splintered everything. It's been so decisive over the last 
has to be at least 20 years that things are just going backward, I guess you would say it. it I'm not sure that 9-11 even unified our country because what it gave us was Homeland Security and the Patriot Act, which is nothing but patriotic. Well, this this is where my fear is, that when a Fortune 500 company, when their board of directors gather, they are not saying, okay, gentlemen, what are we going to do tomorrow? They are looking into the way, way, way future. What can we do today that's going to make our corporation, our business, bigger and more profitable. And this is the way that I believe that the powers that should not be have utilized their strategy from the beginning, from ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Samir, ancient Babylon, ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, ancient, you know, you can always follow the gold and find the elitist. And unless you're willing to play the elitist games, more times than not, it seems like you won't be part of it. You'll be the goyim or the sheeple or the cattle or the product. Exactly. And it's how do we then get away from consciously going into that age of Aquarius and and how do we topple this elitist type mentality that's been, as you said, with the skull and bones society, those are the ones that are controlling everyone. Those are the ones in the fortune 500. Well, absolutely. And they are, They are infiltrating every facet of our lives, utilizing every modality whatsoever to cause that disruption, to cause the divine, and to cause their control. They have a plan, and not only do they have a plan, but they have plan A, B, C, D, sub-15, TAC 5, 7, J, part 4, 5, and 6. So the, they, have, they have been playing this game for a long time. And you're absolutely right. When, when we all ponder that ultimate question, what can we do in this fight for our own sovereignty in each aspect of our life? How do we find our sovereignty physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually? It's a question that's easily put out there, but how do you initiate it? Maybe it's just like eating an elephant one bite at a time. Well, I agree with that, and it is everything comes from within, and we we have to look at what we can do, and we have to start with ourselves first. So we have to more or less awaken, but then we have to find that those groups or that group consciousness that you know we can more or less be with like-minded people to see what we can do. But there is a big uphill plan. And, and, you know, plan probably F or G might be, okay, we're all going to, you know, press the big red button and, you know, we'll still be here. So... Well, hopefully you will all still be here because as I hear the music, that means we're going into our break and join us for the last section of the show.
are listening to the True Frequency Radio Network. No hate, no hype, no, 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 no fear. Something happening here But what it is ain't exactly clear There's a man with a gun over there Telling me I got to beware I think it's time we stop Children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down What's going down? What's going up? What's going to the left, to the right, to the front, to the back? We can spend our entire lives looking in all of those directions and not find the answers as you would if you simply would look at the point where all of these directions meet, the seventh direction, right there in the center of you. And thank you all for being the miracles that you are. And I want to give a special thanks to Phoenix for giving me the opportunity to babble on and babble on and share all of the crazy thoughts of this crippled up Native American because I'm just saying in an insane world, beep, bonk, boodaloop. And tonight, joining us is the uh, good Reverend Dr. Phil, as we uh, hypothesize and discuss this craziness together. Uh, welcome back. Are you are you back with us there? Hello, Naysay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. I was waiting for the mute thing to say unmuted, but I guess I am here. Right. Well, you know, we were talking about this disruption of patterns. We were talking about the powers that shouldn't be and the little bit of the different things that they're doing. But then it, but then it comes down to that big, big question. What do we do? What, what do we do to become consciously aware of the metaphysical possibilities that are within us all and how do we fine tune those and build up our energy, our power to create the best field coercion that we can be. Any tips? Well, the best thing to do is meditation. And that is going to uh, get your personal power going. It's going to be that connection to the divine. But when you can do group meditation and bring in that group consciousness, then that power is exemplified. So if you have 10 people in there, then you have perhaps a thousand times that power, but most of the power is done through love. That is the vibration of the universe. And so when, when we make changes, there is love. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a meek and mild love. It can be that unconditional type love or, or what you call tough love, but it's an awareness that people have to wake up from. You get a lot of people who are so entrenched in what they are told. It is, you know, we get a lot of the fake news and, and people just believe that, but that goes through all layers uh, of your life, through your religion, through educational systems and it is there where you can more or less start to 
erode what those falsehoods are and what the real truths are. And it's part of an exposure that that we have been seeing happening lately with pedophiles and, and sexists and whatever you want to call it. But I, I see it as an eroding of even the powers that be. And then when that gets there, then it's almost unstoppable. Well, you know, I, I agree with you to one aspect, but I also believe that in the whole holy trinity of everything, where there is positive and negative and balance, that that's where we are going to be at one point or another, in a state of positiveness or in a state of negativeness or in a state of content whether it be love, fear, content, you know, you know, and so there's going to be some people that are going to get it and some people that aren't going to get it. There's some people that are going to rise to the top and some people that are going to sink to the bottom. Some people, as in the Native American community, we have a, a little saying where we, where we say, some people become elders and some people grow old. And, and, and this is just the way that the, the life is. And, and I'm not saying don't meditate. I'm not saying don't pray. I'm just saying that you should at least balance out that time of meditation with the time of action. And that action must portray your results of the meditating because we all know what's negative i absolutely have the belief that we know what's negative and we definitely know the difference between ignorance and stupidity and i'm going to clarify it if you don't know ignorance i believe is when you are doing something wrong and then you realize that it's not that it's wrong, it's not the right thing to do, and then you stop. Stupidity is when you know it's wrong and you continue to do the behavior. And with that being said, I am one of the stupidest men I know because I still give up with that specialty double mocha soy every now and then, or I will dip into the sugar once in a while you know and and may may i be forgiven and and may at the point of when i meet my maker or the creator or the architect or whatever you wish to call it that i will be able to look it he she in the eye and say okay i'm ready to take my beating or i'm ready to receive my hug and this is what we need to do in the awakening day we need to make atonement we need to recognize the wrongdoings that we do not only to each other but what we do to ourselves and there is where we meditate to find the answer to the challenges and when I do my prayers, the biggest prayer that I ask is for the strength, the strength to get through it. And it makes me think of the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And as stated many times, words are simple to just fall right out of one's mouth. However, it's making the choice to be the action to make that change for the positive or the negative. I agree with you, and I especially agree with the atonement that we all must look into 
and starting with ourselves. And I know the Course of Miracles, if you've heard about that, it's when you look at atonement, it's really when we're spiritually looking at it, it is at one moment. So if you break up those words. And so it's kind of a transformation as to where we're going and what we can do for humanity. But another thing you mentioned is it's action. It's We have what we've called the law of attra- attachment, the, the law of attra- attraction. It's been out here for maybe 15 years or so. And um, there's lots of people who have endorsed it. Oprah has, Wayne Dyer has, uh, Michael Beck, Beckwith, and, and several others. But when we look at the law of attraction, there we can like tr- manifest anything that we want. That's that spiritual alchemy that's turning lead into gold. But the thing of it is, there's a couple of natural laws that work with it, and one of them is cause and effect, and that one is action, because whatever you want, it's not going to drop into your lap unless you win the lotto. But um, it, it's something that we need to go out there, and we need to, in my case, teach and we need to waken people up, and we need to at least make other people aware of what they are seeing is that illusion, and they need to be more in tune with themselves. Well, this is this is one of the challenges with this new unsocial networking, and, and I, I call it fake book that people will make their comments and their statuses and all of a sudden someone will get upset or their feelings, their ego will get hurt on what they say. And right away their quick response is, stop hating on me. Now, I don't like using the word hate because it's such a strong, strong word. And I don't think it's a very positive word at all. And just because you don't agree with somebody doesn't mean you're hating on them. And then you throw in the aspect that you have what they call trolls, where people are purposely trying to get a rise out of you. And it's, yeah. it's, in, it's incredible how, how, how society is getting into this super hyper political correctness that it's seemingly dividing us more than it is bringing us together. Yes, I totally 